is farmland. On this week's show, AgriLand's Siobhan Walsh drills into the challenges facing malting barley growers. What's happening with the next cap reform? MEP Sean Kelly will join us in studio and Chagas Director Jerry Boyle will be here to talk technology and agri-education. But first, when weather conditions were better, we visited a farmer planting his malting barley. Agriland visited Seamus Duggan on March 1st. He was planting the last few acres of Laureate spring barley for Bort Malt. Once malted, this barley will be used to produce whiskey at Washford Distillery. The ground is turning up absolutely super after the dry year last year. And this is actually beet ground, which is very unusual to see coming up as nice as this. But it is, it's very, very dry. Um, consolidation is probably the most important thing before we sow. We sow in here now and if we get in a couple of hours and it dries off well, we'll ring roll it straight away to firm up that seed bed. A good seed bed is essential and conditions were ideal for sowing. Seamus explained that while malting barley seed is more expensive, other inputs such as pesticides are similar to feed barley. Nitrogen management is key in order to meet protein specifications. However, meeting these protein specs can result in a yield hit. Sometimes I say you're in the lap of the gods with specifications, but I suppose the biggest thing we have to contend with is actually protein. Protein is um, the baseline for, 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 for distilling is 9.3, so it's a very low protein level that we have to get the barley down to that. Uh, I think, I don't know, it's um, been trial and error over the past number of years, but the experts all tell us anyway, from poor malt and the agro people, that you know the earlier we saw it, uh, get in your nitrogen early that it will have used up the nitrogen early in the season and that um, your protein levels should stay down. Today we look at this as being very early we're in the first the so first day of March and it's the last of the laureate to be sold for, for, for Waterford Distillery. Uh, we're incorporating in 30 units of nitrogen in here into the seed bed and on emergence the minute we can see the tram lines we will follow that up with another 65 we'll go to 95 units and hopefully Hopefully the nitrogen and the protein will all work well, but you never know. I'm going to a max of 95 here for the distilling. Um, we'll probably go for, for general malting to maybe 100 to 110, and then feeding we could go to end up to 140 units. We'll be pushing for yield on the feeding. We'll suffer a little bit on yield for the malting, uh, but it's all for the quality of the malting product. We're trying to do everything right to get the spec right. There's an awful lot of spec. And if we can get that spec right, it's nice to get a little bit more forward. Sometimes you wonder, are you just, is easy grow feeding barley and, and none of the hassle, but I suppose we've been mountain barley growers here for generations. And, uh, you know, we take pride in it. We want to get right and we want to support Irish drinks industry down the line. Seamus hopes to be able to continue to grow the crop into the future. Price has become an ongoing argument in the industry. You're, you're looking for your best land to put into mountain barley because uh, I suppose with high gas and traceability, everything is there uh, to produce this quality Irish malt and barley. Um, possibly, as I said probably before, a little bit more for it would be nice. You know, a small bit to go an awful long ways as regards price. And I think, you know, I know I'm part of uh, the committee that works with poor malt. I know we'll get there at the end of the day because none of us wants to see malt and barley going out of this country. And I continue to grow it, hopefully, into the long into the future and hopefully my son or daughter will take over somewhere down along the line. Agriland's tillage specialist Siobhan Walsh joins us in studio now. Siobhan, we see in Seamus's VT there the challenges that he's facing on the ground. Is this situation unique to him or is it widespread? No Claire, unfortunately it's not unique to Seamus. Um, you know, I've been attending a lot of malt and barley meetings and events lately and farmers on the ground are very frustrated. Um, they, they, they say that they need and they want to be paid a higher price for their product um, and have said that they, they have and that they are reducing the acreage of malt and barley that they're growing. Um, and, you know, this is reflected. Chagas have released, you know, every year they release their costs and returns and, you know, a, a three tonne per acre or seven and a half tonne per hectare crop of malt and barley um, is expected to have a, a gross margin of 589 euro per hectare. And compare that with winter feed barley at four tonne an acre or 10 tonne per hectare. Um, feed barley is expected to have a gross margin of 649 euro per hectare. So there's 
a massive difference um, in those two crops. And as Seamus said in the video, he says, maybe um, I'm better off to grow feed barley because um, he won't have the reduction in yield and he won't have to meet the specifications. So maybe it would make his um, job a little bit easier. So a lot of farmers you're hearing are moving away from the malt and barley into the feed. Um, at a time like this, when the drinks industry is booming across the world, it is, it's quite remarkable that there are so many farmers in this specific area, important area within the tillage mm. sector that are facing this. Why has it escalated to this level? Yeah, well, that's very important, a very important point to make. Like whiskey exports last year alone went up by 45 um, million euro to 623 million euro. And in the meantime, then the farmers are struggling um, on the ground. And I suppose it's escalated because last year was a very tough year for farmers. Um, but malt and barley was short and I suppose farmers were paid a good price for their product come harvest time and they see now they were paid a good price then, why shouldn't they get paid a good price now? Um, negotiations then between the IFA and Bort Malt, Bort Malt are the, the, the main buyer of malt and barley in the country and set the price for, for the other um, intakes really. Um, you know, negotiations have dragged on between the two. Um, it was meant to be settled in the autumn. Um, it went into February and farmers rejected the offer that was put before them because they said that they want to be paid a minimum of 200 euro per tonne. And I suppose as farmers like Seamus um, are sowing their barley, uh, they have sowed their barley, they will sow their barley, um, they, they're unsure of a price and their, their future this year, they're planning, um, they're unsure of all that. Um, Siobhan, you've been writing really extensively on this whole issue. Recently, you had CSO figures on imports uh, published in Agriland, and you did a quite an interesting poll as well, which had some very interesting findings about mm -hmm. consumer trends on uh, drinks and yeah. consumer awareness on where the ingredients for these uh, drinks are sourced. Um, what did you find out? Um, well, I suppose the maj an important point to make is that 50% of the people who took the poll weren't actually farmers. Um, and the majority of those people who took the poll assumed that they're Irish drinks. So 89% of them said that they care that their um, Irish brands are made from um, Irish ingredients. And then the majority of them said that they assumed the Irish ingredients were used in the making of these Irish brands. Um, I suppose very positively um, from the survey, those, the participants said that they were concerned about malt and barley growers and their income and also that they, they were willing to pay another cent on their drink and that's very important because Irish malt and barley farmers say if, they, if a cent was added on to the point it would greatly improve their income. And what about the import situation then at the moment, Siobhan? Yes, yeah, so we released um, the import figures for 2018 in the last few weeks. And um, while we can't differentiate between malting and feed barley in those figures, um, we can estimate in Agriland that about 100,000 tonnes of malting barley were imported in 2018 and 100,000 tonnes of maize for distilling were imported in 2018. So... Irish drinks are being produced from these imports. Um, and very worryingly, um, I suppose 28,000 tonnes of malt were imported, which is uh, relatively small, I suppose. But um, this malt was coming from a number of different regions. And a small amount of this malt um, was coming from unknown regions. So the CSO weren't actually able to say where it was coming from. Very interesting. Um, Siobhan, just back to the, the poll for a minute, although this is uh, not a scientific study, it's not scientific evidence that we have, but interestingly, you pointed out that 78% of those surveyed assumed that Irish branded whiskey um, and beer was made by Irish products. Um, what about, are there issues there regarding the marketing of these products? Are, are changes needed there on uh, how the consumers are targeted on these products? Yeah, so I suppose these products have built up their brands on the basis of being produced from Irish products um, produced by Irish farmers. And Irish farmers are getting very increasingly frustrated um, at these advertising campaigns. If you, if, when at the malt and barley meetings that I've been going to, um, you know, farmers have said that they want the pictures of Irish farms and farmers to be taken down from the distilleries and the breweries. Um, one farmer called out a line from the Guinness website, which he said he believed to be, that is now untrue. He's, um, the line from the website reads, um, it begins with barley, barley sown on Irish soil and malted um, behind our famous gates. It's not an easy grain to grow, and which is why we have relationships with farmers that span three generations. And farmers are saying that that relationship is no longer really there. So Siobhan, is there need for legislation to be brought in or what can the stakeholders, state bodies, the government, what kind of action are the farmers calling for on the ground? Yes, well at the minute, um, Irish malt whiskey, Irish pot still, Irish grain whiskey can be made from 
grain from anywhere in the world. Um, so yes, farmers are saying there is a need for legislation for these drinks brands for a certain amount of Irish ingredients to be included um, in these products. And farmers have said, you know, Mark Brown from the IFA's Malt and Barley Committee has said that Irish malt and barley will not be there in a few years time because it's no longer viable to grow. Um, and Agriland has contacted the big stakeholders. Um, Minister Creed said he declined to comment um, on the matter. Borbia have also said that as well. Uh, Siobhan, just finally, we're, we're almost out of time. Just on the Bort malt suppliers, what's next on that issue? Well, the IFA um, are the people who negotiate with Bort malt and they have advised farmers to take the seed, to sow the crop um, and once the crop is sown, hopefully negotiations will improve and a deal will be made. Thanks very much, Siobhan. We'll leave it there. Now, will the next CAP programme be ready for January 2021? Sylvester Phelan has this report. The ongoing reform of the Common Agricultural Policy, better known as CAP, has been subject to lively debate over the past two years across the European Union. The current CAP will expire at the end of 2020, with a new replacement policy supposed to be in place for January 1st, 2021 through to 2027. Under EU Commissioner for Agriculture Phil Hogan's CAP proposal, The Future of Food and Farming, a new look policy is put forward aimed at simpler rules and a more flexible approach. This would see future direct payments to farmers based on results rather than compliance, with funding for the new CAP proposed to be reduced by around 5% due to Brexit. A new CAP implementation system would also be introduced under proposals to give member states a greater degree of subsidiarity, essentially more autonomy. Member states will each have to submit a national CAP strategic plan to the Commission for approval, proposing how and where to invest their CAP funding. The Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine is currently drawing up the Irish strategic plan for CAP 2021 to be submitted by January 1st, 2020, including submissions from farmers and stakeholders. This plan must meet nine clear objectives set down in Europe, aiming to ensure a fair income for farmers, increase competitiveness, rebalance power in the food chain, incorporate climate change action, environmental care, preserve landscapes and biodiversity, support generational renewal, promote vibrant rural areas, and protect food and health quality. The Commission proposes a higher level of support per hectare for small and medium-sized farms to reduce the share of direct payments received above €60,000 per farm and to limit payments at €100,000 per farm, with a view to ensure a fairer distribution of payments. In addition, a minimum of 2% of direct support payments allocated to each EU country will be set aside for young farmers, while Member States must also ensure that only genuine farmers receive support. On an environmental front, new mandatory requirements are earmarked, including an obligatory nutrient management tool to improve water quality, reduce ammonia and nitrous oxide levels, as well as crop rotation instead of diversification, with the protection of peatlands and wetlands also proposed. However, delays in votes on the proposals have complicated matters. It was confirmed last month that the future of CAP will be voted on by the European Parliament Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development in April. This means it will not be possible for the new cap to be decided before the European elections in May, with motions needing one month's wait between discussion at committee and general parliament level. With the EU Parliament taking a two-month recess in the summer, the pressure will be on to get the new policy over the line before the end of the year. We're joined now by Sean Kelly, MEP for Ireland South. Sean, thanks very much for coming in to us. Pleasure, thank you very much. Sean, we can see now at this point that it's unlikely that the current cap reform proposals will go through before the European elections in May. So what happens next? Yeah, that is disappointing because an awful lot of work was done, uh, both by Commissioner Hogan and all of us involved, and a lot of progress was made. But unfortunately, it has been delayed in the Agricultural Committee. Then they're going to vote until April, which means that it cannot be voted by the Parliament. And that's not good because most of the other areas involved in the multi-annual financial framework, seven-year programme, as they call it, are going to go through prior to this parliament finishing. So one has to more or less say it will probably be in limbo until the new parliament meets, and we don't know what the constitution of the new parliament will be in terms of the distribution of seats amongst the groups, etc. 
So while the framework is good, I think most people would be happy with it, and the main points of it, uh, it's a pity that it hasn't been progressed through the Agricultural Committee to get it onto Parliament and voted before we finish in April. Uh, Sean, farmers will obviously want to know what that Per, what that transitional period will mean if we're are we going to roll on the current cap as it is and will that roll on at the current funding rate that's currently applied to the schemes yes and for how long for how long could that be rolled on for it doesn't necessarily be rolled over as of yet i mean if the new parliament sits votes in it it's uh, done and dusted by the end of the year then it will come into operation in time for the next uh, framework program but the time is getting short and it would mean then that there'd be a rollover probably for a year or two. And uh, I think the funding wouldn't be affected because the commitments are there, so the funding would remain the same. Uh, I don't think you could actually cut back on commitments already given. So from that point of view, it mightn't be as catastrophic for the farmers as they would think. It's really the shaping and the funding of the next cap we have to worry about, and that is something we'll have to work on as soon as whoever goes back to Parliament, hopefully I'll be one of them. Sean, if there is a new European Commissioner for Agriculture and Rural Development following the elections, um, how would that potentially affect the current proposals that are on the table and that were drawn up by Commissioner Hogan? Yeah, I've been saying that for some time, that Commissioner Hogan cannot decide the next cap in its entirety. A new Commissioner could come in and want to put his own imprint on it. But the basic principles are agreed. And especially things like allowing uh, member states to decide on the major implications and the major schemes within their own country, abiding by the objectives overall, that will not change. The commitment uh, to generational renewal will not change. The commitment to further simplification will not change. So the basic principles are there, but the big battle, of course, is in the detail and especially the funding, and that's going to be the first and most important battle of all. What about the direct payments? Could that change? No, I think the principle of direct payments is there. Uh, that will remain. The uh, second pillar will remain. The public goods will remain. There will be a battle over what will be in the second pillar in terms of the environment, that's certain, and it will probably come into the first pillar as well. But it's the level uh, of payments that will be decided. And at least in this cap, there isn't the same desire as there was under Commissioner Cholas to flatten payments across Europe. Uh, the flattening will be internally, where, for instance, uh, we will agree in Ireland to put a cap on maximum payments and then divide amongst those at the bottom, which I think is only fair. At, cur at the current Parliament level, where the committees are discussing the proposals at the moment, <laughs> what are some of the most contentious issues that you're coming across? Is it the capping of direct payments? Is it the budget, green architecture? What are, the, what are the sticking points? There are always battles between committees, and especially in relation to CAP, because some people, if they had their way, they'd have no CAP. But thankfully, there's a strong pro-farmer majority in Parliament at this time, anyway. As I said, the next time, we can be 100% sure. So hopefully there will be. But there will always be a battle between the environmentalists and the agriculturalists. The environmentalists, many of them, unfortunately, if they had their way, there'd probably be no agriculture. And there'd certainly, certainly be no CAP and no payments. But when people sit down around the table, they need to get a result. I think uh, common sense prevails. And I actually think there's a lesson to be learned in terms of uh, people being made aware that actually agriculture is good for the environment. That lesson hasn't been learned by many people. They deny it. Without the farmers, who are the custodians of the land, who need the land to be functioning for themselves, then you would have no biodiversity or no environment. And I think that's the message that we will have to get through a bit more. So they are deserve to be supportive for that. They're providing public goods. Uh, they are doing so in a very environmentally friendly way and becoming more environmentally friendly as time goes by with increased technology, etc. And they are the things we will have to push very strongly as of now. Sean, you mentioned there about that struggle between the Environment <coughs> Committee and the Agriculture Committee at European level. Who is Farmers would want to know who's winning that battle right now. Well, I think that uh, common sense will win it at the end of the day. And farmers are very worried about the whole climate change agenda. And the more I study it and the more I meet people from all walks of life, and particularly businesses, I think there isn't the same uh, fear that there seems to be. It isn't necessary 
because agriculture has a good uh, image, number one. It is a good story to tell. It's going to decarbonize uh, a lot over the next number of years without impacting on production or without impacting on competitiveness. And we, particularly in Ireland, we have a huge opportunity to take an overall picture, which we have to do because we have to draw up a national climate and energy plans. And we can do an awful lot in relation to energy supply and transport and buildings, which we will do. And all that will contribute to us meeting our targets for 2030. And Sean, just finally, we're nearly out of time. Um, a possible carbon tax at some stage in, in the future, is that something farmers should be preparing for? And what is, is the member states position, the other member states position on that? <clears throat> Just very uh, it's, cer out. it's certainly on the agenda, but I think what might transpire is a trade-off in emissions, because a lot of the good work that would be done will be reducing emissions that will compensate for the emissions that are made. And then, of course, uh, big energy and so forth will continue to use what they call the ETS. So I don't think it will work out as badly at all, because I see huge technological improvements very quickly that are going to lead us to meet our targets in 2030. Lots of food for thought there, Sean. Thanks for coming in to us. Now, what do the students of Kildalton College think of the new farming simulator on campus? Here's Siobhan Walsh. Students at Chagas' Agricultural College in Kildalton have been learning how to drive tractors indoors. Farmland paid a visit and Vice Principal James Ryan explained how the technology has benefited students while machinery specialist Francis Quigley went through the ins and outs of how it works. I think uh, we brought it uh, as, a, as a tool to uh, help students that come from limited, um, limited experience on their home farms. I think it's essential that uh, they get used to uh, the simulator and then maybe once they've gained confidence on the simulator they can go forward and move on to the real thing on the tractors. But I think uh, the simulator is very real, it's very uh, lifelike and uh, it works really well and students seem to benefit from it. Students seem to uh, to be able to uh, take the experience from the simulator and then put it in, uh, in the real world on the tractor. So I think it's, it's a very beneficial tool to us here in the college. Yeah, my name is Francis Quigley. I'm the machinery specialist in Chagas. And we're here in Cadalton today and we're just looking at the simulator uh, that's been in here on trial for the last number of weeks. The simulator was in here on trial and um, I suppose it was uh, Something we came across at the Lama Show a number of years ago um, and we just thought it would be a, a, an excellent tool for helping the weaker students uh, to develop their skills. The student actually has to, before they can actually operate the, the tractor, they have to go through, identify various components on the tractor. Then they'll uh, be asked to go through a series of pre-start checks, so safety checks such as mirrors, such as checking uh, the tyres, checking wheel rims. Uh, and then once they've assessed that the tractor is fit and safe to use, then they can progress on to carry out a number of different tasks. Some of the tasks that they have to do are driving through an obstacle course. So the first task is relatively easy. It's just the operator uh, with uh, just a tractor with no implement attached and they'll drive down through an obstacle course. But as they go down through the obstacle course, it gets progressively more difficult. And the, the simulator is able to record any mistakes or any uh, bollards or that that they uh, may, might hit as they progress through it. It really gives them a great opportunity to, I suppose, to build confidence, you know, so that they can get up on this machine. We've you'd nervous uh, students who haven't a lot of experience uh, uh, when they go down the yard and they've uh, getting up in a big machine for the first time. Uh, it can be very daunting and they can be very nervous uh, trying to do tasks down there. Whereas up here, they're a lot more confident and a lot more relaxed. If they hit something or bang something, it doesn't matter. You know, they can just even, uh, God forbid, uh, they do serious damage to the tractor. They just press restart and, and everything goes again. I suppose the, the, the ideal situation would be that they'd have done maybe five, ten hours on the simulator uh, and to a certain standard. Uh, there is reports that will be generated from the unit and we can see uh, how well they've progressed on the simulator. If we feel they need more time on the simulator, we can give more time on the simulator but if we feel that uh, they're confident and competent on the simulator then they can go out and uh, uh, work on the real thing. It's more complicated unfortunately tractors are becoming uh, with controls and everything and it can be very daunting uh, for somebody coming from maybe a basic tractor getting up into a high-end tractor uh, for the first time. As operator skills improve students move on to more complicated tasks before graduating to the outdoors.
Uh, Jack and Luke are on our advanced machinery course, so we would expect them to have a high level of skill on the tractor operation. But uh, there is other uh, tools and equipment on it, such as the combine. There's a whole range of different machines uh, that can be used. I would say there's balers, mowers, so even if it takes something like the baler, if he gets into the baler uh, and he engages a uh, thousand speed PTO uh, instead of the 540, he'll damage that baler and his, uh, his session will be over and he'll have to bring the, the baler back to the yard to be repaired. Other uh, items that can be done is even you know hitching on and off trailers. Uh, so there's uh, a full hitch control and unlock, uh, raise and lower the arms to, to uh, drop off that trailer and then to pick it up again. Francis hopes that in the future simulators will become the norm at agricultural colleges throughout the country. Uh, simulators are, are have huge benefits. You know, uh, they're being used across all sorts of industries. You know, you need, we, we can even see from the construction equipment that's on this, uh, the the skills and information that's been produced out of that. I think if if, if it's engaged with, uh, there can only be good uh, coming from it. Jerry Boyle, the director of Chagas, joins us in studio now. Jerry, thanks very much for coming into us. Jerry, we saw in the VT there down in Kildalton College, the new farming simulator that's operating down there. We're living in a very different world now. A lot of technology is changing how education is taking place in the classroom. Um, in addition to the, to the simulator, at a, at a broader level, how is Chagas kind of rebuilding its teaching activities and its classroom learning um, to, to bring in new technologies into the, into the educational environment? Thanks, Claire. Uh, it's I guess the whole digital revolution is taking is progressing at an extraordinary pace, not only within the classroom but outside the classroom, and the classroom has to has to be responsive. Uh, the simulator you're talking about is one of two simulators we have now in in our colleges. We have a, a forage um, forestry harvesting simulator at our college in Ballyhays which is even more sophisticated than the one in, in Kildalton. But uh, young people f are really tuned in to the whole digital technology. I mean, they, they're avid users of all the digital tools and social media tools. So it's a kind of a natural progression for them to take up with, with the, um, the physical technologies that are also on offer. But we've had to revamp our educational program the last couple of years uh, looking to the future in terms of requirements and it's not only the digital dimension of that although that's a very important component in terms of how we teach but we find that our students in agriculture um, and forestry and um, horticulture and equine um, they love the practical application of what they learn. They're less comfortable inside in the classroom so we've had to rethink our whole way of teaching uh, programs um, and the balance between what students learn in the classroom and what they learn outside. And anything, uh, students love to be able to apply their learning. So I think the, the simulators that we have are really, really um, popular with students for that reason. And we've adopted what we call now a problem-based learning approach, where with the digital age, students can learn uh, independently far more and um, but they need to have a focus for for their learning and that's hence the the emphasis on problem-based learning we borrowed a lot from thinking in Europe in that respect so I would say over the next few years the major change actually it mightn't be visible externally will be um, the whole approach to learning with the emphasis very much on students applying knowledge to practical farming situations. And do you think technology can play a stronger role then? Do you think that the student would be better prepared after taking part in technology such as simulators in the in the classroom side before they go out into the yard, before they go to the practical element? No, absolutely. Of well, obviously, there's a there, there's a very uh, there's a cost reason why we're doing this. Machines are very expensive. So it's, if the student is going to crash out on the machine, it's better that uh, it happens on a simulator rather than on the real thing. From a health and safety point of view, it's very, it's critically important as well. But I think the, you have to look at the digital revolution in the round. I mean, it's not just about, as I say, simulators. I mean, students are using digital tools to learn, and they're very comfortable learning through social media. 
and uh, we have to provide them with that opportunity. And to some extent, we're catching up with students. I mean, they're leading the way. I mean, they're using AgriLearn, for example, and they're using all the available digital tools. And we're trying to now incorporate that into teaching, into the teaching program. So, Jerry, the students, as you say, they're digital students. So does that require new thinking, new budgeting strategies, new staffing models, um, as well as the curriculum for Chagas education? No, absolutely. I mean, it certainly requires our teachers to be tuned into that uh, that a digital world, so to speak, and some of them acquired this through their own self-learning. Others will, we will need training programs and so on. But it's happening right across the agricultural sector. We've just announced an investment of forty million in precision dairy uh, program, uh, which we led from Moore Park over the next five or six years, and that's all going to be about the application of digital technologies and the Internet of Things to dairy farming. Now, so that's going to be happening on the dairy farm. That has to be reflected then within our colleges. I mean, for example, I would say Pasture Base Ireland is at the forefront of the, of the application of digital technology through the, uh, to the measurement of grass and the transportation of that data uh, via Bluetooth through to the cloud and then analyzed in a form that farmers can take decisions about. So um, that's where farming is going. That's where research is going. So our educational programs uh, have to be really in line with that. I suppose at the moment as it stands, we don't have a whole lot of evidence about technology and education and the, the uh, results, what results it's producing mm. uh, because it's, it's growing, it's changing all the time. Are there concerns there about, about that type of education undermining the more conventional classroom role of the teacher? I don't think so. I mean, I was in education myself. I spent 20 years in university, you know, and there's a room for all... Uh, uh, modes of uh, communication really and education is about effective communication at the end of the day um, I mean I don't think uh, I hope we won't ever ab abandon maybe it might, it's the the whiteboard and marker or it used to be the chalk and blackboard uh, but we blend that with the, with the digital tools you know it's standard now for example to use Moodle or Blackboard as a backup to um, to the classroom and students expect that. I mean, if there is one criticism I would have as an educator is sometimes with digital technology, students can be more passive. I mean, education has to be an active activity. I used to have a professor in college talked about the need to focus your brain to the point of a pen. I think that's very, still very true, particularly in applied subject like agricultural science. So I think it's a blend of all approaches to communicating, to igniting that spark within the student in the classroom. Um, Jerry, we're almost That's out important. of time, um, but there's a lot of talk recently about robots in the future and robots replacing humans. There's a lot of worry about that, especially mm. in rural towns. Um, in the classroom, is there a role for artificial intelligence in terms of teaching tutors or teaching assistants in the future? Is that something Chagask is looking at? Or well, it... on, in research, of course, we are looking at that. I mean, we're looking, we're using robots now in our research programs, particularly in food. Um, I think artificial intelligence and augmented reality tools, they're fascinating uh, tools in the idea that you can, for example, uh, say have students in a machinery course, you know, looking at the innards of a machine, of an engine, you know, in virtual reality. I mean, that's an extraordinary tool. Um, that ha hasn't happened yet, but I expect as we sort of study these technologies within a research environment, we'll translate them into the classroom. Thanks, Jerry. That's great. And we'll be watching very closely. That's all we have time for. If you have a story, reach out to us on any of our platforms. Thanks for watching. See you next week.